you, you defer to old age. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I was his opponent uh, when he got his PhD. So, uh, um, the, the, uh, thank you very much for, uh, well, th this is addressed to uh, uh, Professor Abba Omar. Um, your presentation was extremely uh, transparent. Um, now, what I miss completely in the presentation uh, is any discussion of the, the means, the instruments, the policies, the institutions that would be required to achieve those targets. Now again, uh, uh, excuse me for asking this question, but I was brought up in the, I was a student of uh, Tinbergen and uh, the, uh, his contribution was really to the theory of economic policy. And the essence of the theory of economic policy is, of course, you have to specify your objectives, your targets, but you have to also have a clear conception of the instruments, including institutions, uh, policies that are needed to achieve those objectives. And I, maybe uh, uh, the uh, scarcity of time made it impossible for you to go into it. But I think it's, it's, it's quite incomplete to just set a list of targets and then uh, leave it at that because the, the extent to which the realization of these objectives uh, is possible or not depends very much on, on the political feasibility of uh, the right types of institutions and policies. Okay, thank you. Uh, this gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was quite interested in this uh, Brazilian presentation and you had some conclusions and discussions about what could be carried over to Africa. And one of the themes you mentioned was national consensus around these uh, policy efforts. And if you look at Africa, I think there is pretty broad national consensus on the contents of policies in the countries that I know of. The problem in Africa seems to emerge when you implement them. Who is going to be in power, which ethnic group, or which side is going to manage these? And that is where the consensus breaks down and imbalanced su supply of public goods across the regions uh, or groups that tend to undermine the support for, uh, for the government which is required for this to work. And I've been looking a bit at the industrial policies, for example, which you also discuss, where They've taken over some good ideas from Asia, but they've broken down by the partial or impar the partial implementation of the policies. So my question is really, is Brazil immune to this uh, kind of distributional risks associated with interventionist policies? In Africa, this is a serious concern, I think. The lady there. Thank you. Uh, Nadia von Jacobi from the University of Pavia. Uh, thank you very much for two very interesting presentations. I have a question for Armando and Ed. Um, and my question is partially linked to the question that was just made. Because I think the real issue is how do you really get to the consensus, who are the agents that drive this? And um, I was wondering from what I read about Brazil whether you think that the crucial uh, role was deployed by the PT, the Workers' Party, in really bringing together the poor and the hidden middle class, or whether you think that it was the tools used, in particular, the sort of uh, control of inflation and a mix of policies that made every group partially content. And now uh, yeah, my question relates to the Brazilian model um, and its sustainability. Uh, and the question is, um, what about the sustained, less destructive and more globally, environmentally friendly use of Brazil's natural resources? Okay, then we have here. Okay, Jukka Virtila from the University of Tampere here in Finland. I have a question to the first two speakers. Um, uh, you referred to the um, 
important role of tax system in collecting the, uh, the tax revenue and, and, and obviously financing the transfers. Uh, and that, of course, also depends on the extent of, of the shadow economy and the informal sector. So, so could you comment on the, on the relative size of that in, in, in Brazil uh, and, and in, in, in some of the African countries? And secondly, has, has Brazil uh, uh, conducted specific measures to combat the informal sector and uh, have, have these been uh, evaluated? Okay, good. Okay, why don't we start replying this one? Uh, the Brazilian can try, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll, I'll okay. kick off. The Anglo-Brazilians. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much for those uh, very uh, interesting, well-put questions. Uh, a lot there. Um, this issue of the national consensus, how does one build that in countries in Africa where there are clear ethnic, ethnic um, divisions? Um, is there anything similar that we see in Brazil? Well, not in the same way. But uh, we have to recognize that Brazil is a highly diverse country from a regional perspective. There are parts of the country that have historically been acutely poor. There are parts of the country that have historically been, at the federal level, politi politically highly overrepresented. So somehow um, a consensus has been manufactured uh, despite those very clear historical differences which run right back to the colonial era. And I think there may be something there that Africa can learn from, although I'm not pretending um, that we're dealing with something which is identical at all. Clearly that isn't the case. But I think it's long been part of um, Brazilian political culture, the importance of arriving at a consensus. And I think that partly answers another question that we had. Um, is this all about the PT? Uh, was it the PT that articulated the views of certain sectors of society that weren't <coughs> articulated before, well, it's certainly been very effective at doing that. But we have to understand this whole program, um, this model, if we could call it that, that we're seeing unfold at the moment, is a product not just of the PT's own activism, but in fact um, what happened under the previous governments of Fernando Enrique Cardozo, who was a social democrat. <laughs> So it goes a bit further than just looking at one admittedly highly successful and influential political party. It's looking at an entire political system, an entire political culture, which getting back to the first point, has somehow been able to put this consensus together despite quite significant internal spatial divisions in terms of the distribution of income. And of course, as we know in Brazil, there are strong ethnic divisions as well. I mean, it is an ethnically divided society. Um, we, we can't overlook that. I think sometimes in Brazil they wish that we would overlook that, uh, but, but there are those clear divisions there. So there are some limited parallels. I'll just say one more thing before I, I hand over to Armando on this business of the informal sector, because I, I, there's a specific point I can put here. How do you bring the informal sector into the tax base? How do you strengthen the revenue streams? Um, well, Brazil actually has done this with some of the indirect taxes um, with a system known as Simples, simple, which is about making it easier um, for micro-enterprises to register to, for, for tax purposes, uh, to reduce the amount of paperwork that they have to do. Um, and many businesses have then found it advantageous actually to come clean um, and emerge into the formal economy and, 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 and file um, accounts and, and do their taxes um, because the compliance costs have reduced very significantly and that's one of the factors although by no means the only factor which has helped Brazil to strengthen its revenue base and I think it is a, is a clear sort of little policy and in the scheme of things this is quite a small policy maybe again there's, there are potential lessons there. Um, just, just a, f a few points um, on, the, on the shadow economy. Um, I'm not sure about the shadow economy, but in terms of informal employment, it's around 35% of the, of the labor force. 35% the of the labor force do not uh, have a contract of employment. Um, and um, you know, it covers both kind of urban and, and, and rural areas. Um, th there are two interesting points about that. Of course, you know, as, you, as you rightly point out, uh, rates of informality in African countries are much higher, 75, 80%. Um, so so that, that, that's an issue. What is interesting uh, about Brazil is that the, um, this, the wages in the informal sector 
uh, roughly follow the government determination of the minimum wage. That is, there is a lighthouse like, like effect. So that uh, changes in the uh, minimum wage have an impact both <coughs> on the um, um, transfers provided to people in poverty and, and to pensioners and so on, but it also has an impact on um, um, the, the salaries of people working informally. So that, that it gives a very strong kind of, uh, uh, it's almost a single lever that could, you could change quite a lot just by uh, changing the uh, minimum wage. And um, Lula, in, in, during his two administrations, the minimum wage increased in real terms by 60%. Uh, and that, has, that is really at the back of quite a lot of the good stories about uh, improvements or inclusive growth in Brazil. Um, on the issue of consensus, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to, um, um, Eddie's already kind of given some um, ideas on this. I'm sorry to kind of uh, perhaps add to that because this is really kind of crucial. Um, if, if we want to have a chronology, uh, 1985, Brazil recovers from 20 years of dictatorship. Between 1985 and 1988, there is a big national discussion as to what they are going to do. Um, and the uh, decision is made to have a new constitution, uh, which we can read as a new social contract. Uh, and the new social contract is extremely progressive, for example, in terms of rights to social protection, rights to health care and education. Um, and also provides responsibility of government to take, to take this over, uh, perhaps for the first time in certain areas. And then from uh, 1988 onwards, you have this kind of process, the break that we discussed around 1993 of the implementation of those policies. So luckily in Brazil, we can even time the point at which that new, uh, new social contract uh, took place. There are uh, very interesting um, kind of perhaps uh, second order uh, effects that are really important. For example, the, there has been a concentration of power. I mean, s some of the speakers in previous sessions have mentioned the, uh, the view that decentralization might be important in the context of, of Africa. Uh, in fact, what it has happened in Brazil is a concentration of power in the federal government, particularly in terms of ta tax collation. Uh, Bolsa Familia is a, is, an, is a federal policy as opposed to a local policy, although it had its origin in, uh, in municipal kind of innovation. So I think that there are those issues too. Uh, it's true as the point that was made, the uh, Workers' Party has now become a national party, which used to be very regionally based on the south of Brazil, but it now extends to other regions in Brazil. Uh, people say that it's to do with Bolsa Familia, because that allows the work Workers' Party to have uh, something to contribute in, in, those, in those areas. So th there are kind of interesting issues about the kind of political regime and that, how, it, how that has developed uh, over time. And I'll just stop there. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm not a professor. <laughs> I hope I do sound like one. Um, Thank you very much for raising that question. Uh, I think I've touched on some of it in the paper. Uh, uh, and so, you know, as you quite correctly said, trying to cram a lot of the stuff in. But um, you know, in, if you look at direct poverty reduction uh, measures, uh, it's covered the full gamut of um, no-fee schools, subsidizing housing, uh, medical services, and so forth but also direct social grants as well. So you find that uh, the numbers increased from, in 1997, were about 2.4 million to about 12 million by 2012 on social grants. Um, now, this has had a number of different effects because you find that um, although the, uh, the almost, uh, almost universal entry into the education system but the throughput to the matriculation, you know, there's a dramatic drop. And so we've been looking at the possibility of some of the Brazilian experience where you incentivize certain sort of uh, uh, results so that people actually finish, say, the education, uh, the, the full metric uh, schooling. Uh, so that the child, and one of the ways we're doing that is ensuring that the child support grant should be extended to the year that we expect them to finish matric and that on completion that they would continue to be receiving uh, that kind of thing. So there's been a number of instruments around that. And then on the, on the industrial side, um, there's uh, one example is the uh, investment into the automotive sector 
uh, there's been a number of initiatives around agricultural sector. Uh, but the most important one, um, which is, uh, again, from the figures you would have seen in previous presentation, uh, the, the problem with the supply of skilled and semi-skilled labor coming into an economy which is increasingly demanding that. So on the further education training, which is sort of uh, post-secondary education, but not quite university level, we're seeing an expansion of service providers in that area sponsored by government. So there's a plethora of different measures that we're trying to implement. Thank you. Thank you. Let me close this session, but let me first make an observation on uh, the pessimistic Nordic observation by Arne. I, th I think there are examples of uh, societies where these ethnic divisions have been more or less bridged over. I think the most famous one is uh, Malaysia. So Malaysia uh, applied policies in which the, the very uh, rigid division uh, in employment, uh, jobs, I mean the Chinese basically run the business and then the Malay, the countryside and the administration uh, has been uh, uh, reduced. There are still tensions, but uh, the income gap has been reduced. The, and another one is Northern Ireland. And, uh, and for Africa, there is a very interesting paper by uh, Francis Tuart, uh, who looks at uh, uh, six African countries and looks at uh, horizontal inequality, which is a specialty, and in which uh, uh, different ethnic groups uh, declare different uh, propensities to make peace or to cooperate and uh, so on and so forth with others. And the, the question is, I think that is in the northeast, uh, of, I mean, in the case in Brazil, the northeast was like a piece of poor Africa, not, not rich Africa, in Brazil. And so, so at least the literature argues that uh, if you are able to create a large enough middle class, whether they are from the northeast or they are Tutsi or Hutu and so on and so forth, you may create uh, uh, common interest. Or if you are really, you may be right, or I mean, uh, if racial hatred is really so deep, then even if you equalize opportunities, I mean, the class, then people will, I mean, the problem will persist. But in many cases, that perhaps may be a proxy of uh, economic discrimination or uh, uh, spatial discrimination. And then, in fact, we do have five or six examples where the problem has been partly resolved. So thank you very much to thank our uh, finalists, and uh, thank you very much to you. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>